Hi everyone, welcome back to Heavenland Devotions, the Little Green Pasture. Praise the Lord, I'm really glad you're here today. I don't want to waste a minute of time because I have some scriptures I want to read and I want to talk about some things that really grab my heart today in devotion. And so I'm going to pray and I'm going to get started because, yeah, I don't know, because I've been, you know, in the Lord all morning and I, I just want to get started. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for yet another day, another day to speak about you, like we're told to speak about you from day to day, to show forth your glory day by day, and to talk of all of your wondrous works. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for this day to day, and I thank you for this message that you've given to me, but I ask you now to help me. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to help me to speak these words just as I heard them today in my own heart when you were speaking to me and how it began to um, to bud and to open up like a flower. And, and then, Lord, I began to just ruminate in that word that I was seeing today. I pray, Lord, as I speak that I will lose nothing by your spirit. And I pray for your presence, Lord Jesus, which is always the mark is always the mark, just like Cleopas and his friend, as they were talking about the things that had just happened, you drew near unto them. Therefore, Jesus, draw near unto us, draw near unto us, and Lord, be with me, be with my mouth, for I offer it all up to you in your wonderful name, Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so today I was reading in first Corinthians chapter nine and I've been praying, you know, for the last couple of days, Lord, show me from your own heart. What do you want me to teach? What do you want me to share? And <clears throat> I used to get really nervous. I'm sorry. I have a little something in my throat. I used to get like, Lord, I don't have anything yet. And I used to get nervous. And that was years ago. Now I'm confident in him because he wants to uh, his word to go forth more than any of us. I think we so much stumble on how we sound and if we're saying it right. And I don't want to stumble on any of that. I think of what Pharaoh said, what have we done in letting them go? Perhaps by now they're entangled in the wilderness and I'm not going to be entangled in the wilderness. And I would say to you, don't, don't get entangled. I'm glad I'm not perfect. And I'm glad a lot of times I make mistakes <clears throat> And that I can just be myself before you. Because if I can't be myself before you, then why am I even here? I love the fact that we can be our true selves in Jesus Christ because each one of us are a unique creation of him. And therefore, it complements him. And it's a blessing to him. So here I go. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 9 deals with the apostles. And they're, you know, talking, going back and forth about <clears throat> what was uh, just um, shop talk. I'll just put it that way in modern terms. And then they got to talk about their living, how they live being servants of the Lord, workers for the Lord. And they even quote um, Moses, where it says, well, first of all, it says, who go with a warfare in his own charges and who planted the vineyard and doesn't eat the fruit thereof. And they he even, and Paul even quotes Moses and says, um, do not muzzle an ox while he treadeth out the corn. And so I just wanted to say that part because you can definitely read it yourself, but I'm going to read uh, from verse 10 through 16, and then I'm just going to let it flow. That's just the best way. And there has to be joy in it too, right? Or say if he it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, that is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? 
Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die, that that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And when I saw that part, necessity is laid upon me, that was the one thing the Holy Spirit just stamped upon my heart. It grabbed me. And I began to see, he began to enlarge those few words. Necessity is laid upon me. Notice he starts off with we. But when it got down to the brass tacks, he's saying, look, I'm going to speak for myself. Look, I am with these people and we're preaching the gospel. And we know that as people that serve the Lord, that there is a power because he spoke about a power. He said there he talked about. Let me just go back and look at it real quick. He said, if others be partakers of this power over you. See, nothing should have power over us. And, you know, and this is, yes, this is ministerial, but I'm talking to you, whoever you are. I'm not talking just to a certain select class of people today. I'm talking to you. I'm just like you. Yes, I have these videos. Yes, I'm sharing devotions, but I'm as common as you. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad because when I preach this gospel to you, you could take that same gospel and you could preach this gospel and you could preach it without saying a word in a bad marriage. You could preach the gospel and how you treat animals and how you treat people at work or how you just live. Because our life really, he says, Paul says that we are open, that we are letters not, uh, not written with ink, but by the spirit. And so our lives do preach the gospel. Because the greater is he that is in us, is he that's in this world. He's living in you. And the presence of God is dwelling in you. He said, uh, if others be partakers of this power over you. So he's saying, look, there's other people that are taking, they're, they're, put, they're, they're requiring something from you. They're, they're using this power that's given to them. But they have a power over you. And he says, are we not rather, in other words, look, whoever these are, they're not legit. We're the legit ones. He said, nevertheless, we, nevertheless, we have not used this power. He said, it said, we suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And that so moved me because I said to my own self, and you know, well, it's, it's very active when the Holy Spirit is revealing something to you because it's not just one stream. He's bringing a lot in and therefore it makes it somewhat difficult to explain spiritual things. But this is what I, this is what I was seeing. So we know that if anything has power over you in any kind of a spiritual or a religious setting, get out from underneath it. The only person that has, should have power over your life with joy is Jesus Christ. And he still, and that doesn't mean he takes control of you. He always lets you choose. You notice Jesus never makes you do anything. He always says, if he lets you choose, but he says, we haven't used this power, but we suffer all things. And I, I he says, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So you see that there's a hindering that happens because I've seen it myself in life. I've seen ministry start out um, where the people were just like start out small and they were alive and the rivers were flowing and people were being touched and and the poor people were coming in, the poor, the maimed, the blind. And they were receiving the cold waters to a thirsty soul from a far country. And the more people came, all of a sudden everything just became a big money operation. And then it turned into something where then the poor, the maimed, and the blind were again pushed out. And there, that there is a power we all have to be careful of. You know, I'll tell you something. 
I love that scripture that says, God has spoken once and twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. There is no other power but of the Lord, but of the Holy Spirit. And, and if we are truly servants of the Lord, whatever you're doing in your life, because you're preaching the gospel, either you're preaching it to your teaching your little ones how to be, you're growing them up to be strong believers in the Lord, to know Jesus Christ and to walk in all of his ways, or you're running a business, whatever the case may be, whoever you are, whatever your situation is, you're being alive and because you're in the word and you're in prayer and you're you're just living as a believer in the common daily life, then you are letters of God, not written with ink, but by the Holy Spirit. And his presence is with you and upon you, and that's his power upon you. And I like when he says, um, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And of course, he's talking about the, Jew, the Jews and their temple. But we are the temple now of the Holy Spirit. But God, but see, he says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That to me is open-ended. But notice he says the Lord ordains it that we should live of the gospel. And when we're living of the gospel and wherever you are called in your life, that he will undertake and oversee your life to maintain it, to preserve it, to feed you, to clothe you. Remember in the beginning, he starts off the, the whole chapter with we, we, we have done this and we don't do that. But then he steps aside from all that. And I love this when Paul says this, he says, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things where he's stepping out from among the crowd. He's like, look, I'm going to stand. And I'm always, I'm always teaching this about that spiritual maturity where you own your walk in Jesus Christ. Where you say you can you can be with people. We are always part of a community of the body of Christ, right? I'm part of a community of believers, and I'm sure you are too. But there comes a time where you say, I, where you say, I have used none of these things, and neither have I written any of these things. Yes, but he was, he's talking about Moses, and we know that this man was absolute proficient in the law of Moses. So he's saying, neither have I written these things that it should, should so be done to me. In other words, look, I could use the law. I could use what Moses said. And I could demand from you to supply my life and being while I preach the gospel to you. But I love what he said. It would be better for me to die. I would rather die than that any man should make my glory and void. Notice how he says any man. Be careful. Be careful about where you're putting yourself and what you are lending yourself to. Because you see, when Jesus Christ came and he began to preach the gospel of eternal salvation, he preached it free. Because it doesn't belong to anybody but Jesus. Now the gospel, Paul said, he called it his gospel my gospel, not because it originated with him, but he was shown the mysteries of the gospel, those seven mysteries of the gospel. But he talked about there being a glorying, but it was not going to come from any man. He's not going to use anything. He said, look, I know I have the right to have this thing, to have people funnel money over to me and to give me everything. And he's like, no way. You know why? Because no one, he said, that any man should make my glorying void. Because you see, when we start to work in the Lord, it's very easy if we do not watch what we are doing. I don't care, again, what you're doing. I'm not talking about those in the pulpit. You too, if you're in a pulpit, but I'm just saying all of us really. Because even those at the pulpit, if you're listening, you're not always at the pulpit every second. You have a family. You have a real life. And 
you have to have that glory. All of us it has to come from the man, Christ Jesus. You know, there is a real joy not being owned, having that power over us, isn't it? I know in my own self, there are times I, I got involved with different ministries and it first started out, it was happy and joyful. And next thing you know, there was things that were being demanded of me, uh, guilt trips being played on everybody, um, people feeling guilty because they didn't have enough to give. I mean, there was a time in my life, let, let me go back a bit. There was a time in my life where I was so broke, like I was so ridiculously broke, like I'm talking like broke. And I was so in despair in my life. I mean, I was like in absolute survival mode for the longest time. Every penny that I had went to paying bills just to barely eat and feed my kids and have a roof over our heads. And there was nothing left over. And there's times I was driving on fumes. And so there was a couple churches I was going to, and it was like, I was so desperate. I was so wounded. I was so hungry and crushed. And everything was about, um, well, you know, you know, you should probably start giving since you've been here. Now, I'm not about not giving. If love gives and we're compelled to give as the Holy Spirit leads us in our heart. Remember, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that every man should give according as his heart purposes to give, not grudgingly, but with a cheerful heart. And so I would do other things instead, like I'd volunteer, I'd teach Sunday school where I do this or that. But there was always this feeling that I would see others that were in my case and they just always went around sad. Like they felt they didn't measure up because they couldn't give money. They felt they didn't measure up. And I've seen some real abuse in churches of um, the big donors having the pastor's hand of friendship while others that were desperate were completely pastors walking by them not even looking at them. And, you know, I've always been that, uh, that person, even from a child where I always went for the underdog. I always went for that person. It was, it was put in me, but I believe that when we are born again and we truly are made alive in Jesus Christ and we love his word and his word is alive in us, it is alive and it has a, it wants a way out. It's, it's a necessity laid upon us. Have you ever felt that necessity? And I want to break away for a second here because he said, that for, I have nothing to glory for necessity is laid upon me. He said, yo, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And he's talking about a woe. That's a woe unto death. Like he's already said it. He said, um, it would be better for me to die. That is some extreme words. And you know, that necessity that was laid upon him said, He'll care for me. There's no power over me. You don't have to give me anything, but I'm going to preach that gospel because necessity is laid upon me. I have had necessity laid upon you. Have you? Have you felt that necessity laid upon you? That power? See, he was talking about uh, there, there's power. He says, we have not abused this power. He talked about this power on you, upon you. I'm going to get that right. He said, this power over you. But he wasn't talking about that. He didn't want that power. You notice it's a bondage. It's like, well, there's this power, something trying to control what the Holy Spirit is inside of us to live and move and have his being and to do everything he wants us to do and to go in any direction he wants us to go and to say whatever he wants us to say and be prompt and be ready to to follow the Lord and to do what he wants us to do and speak what he wants us to speak and say what he wants us to say and go where he wants us to go, where we're truly living the Ruth vow. Where, wherever thou goest, will I go? Where you lodge, I will lodge. Even where you die, I'll die. I'll be buried where you're buried. I say that to myself all the time. I say, Lord, I said, I know that we are allowed to vow if we do, if we mean to keep it. And I said, Lord, that Ruth vow more and more becomes my own vow. And is it not because love is that force of power? If there's any power over us, it's God's love upon us. It's the power of his love that compels, that moves, 
that makes bold, that makes you speak out, that turns you into another person. See, that necessity that's laid upon you is this. Have you ever been somewhere where maybe you see somebody and maybe you're with some people, but all of a sudden your heart begins to throb in your chest and you're looking at maybe a person, a woman, a man, whoever it is, and the Holy Spirit is saying, join yourself to that person. And you know that you're taking a risk because you're with people, they want you to do something or there's only a minute left, but you say, you go ahead without me. Necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me. I'd rather, it would be better for me to die. And woe is me if I do not do what Jesus wants me to do with that person over there. You see that necessity that's laid upon you is God's love. I pray that necessity that is laid upon was laid upon Paul. I pray in Jesus name that necessity be laid upon you and that you will never let any other power be laid upon you or have power over you or it has anything to do with the Holy Spirit within you, with Christ's ownership of you. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Can you, can we say that? Because I, everything in me is ironclad. Like, yes, I will say that. You know why? Because I have been controlled and controlled situations many different times and different circumstances and religious circles. And every single time I felt like I was, I wanted out. I didn't feel the Lord in anything but to run. And when I got away, I felt so free and alive. See, when necessity is laid upon you, necessity should be laid upon you your entire life as you walk through this earth, as you share Christ in the things given you to do every day of your life. That necessity to me speaks so powerfully to me, greater than I think I could even give it the, I, I don't have, even have the ability to take it deeper, yet my spirit man feels the depth of it, of that, of those riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the unsearchable riches of Christ laid upon you. I pray that you will remember that, that your glory will never be void. When you really start to think, and meditate on that necessity being laid upon you. My prayer for you is that you be content to pour out your rich life into other wasted, weary lives and see them blessed and made more beautiful and then hide away and let Christ have the honor. Work work for God's eye. And even then, just go away in the shade. We don't seek a reward. Seek to be a blessing and never think of any kind of self-advancement. Be content to do good in Christ's name. You know, Jesus will take care of you. He always will, as long as you allow that necessity that is laid upon you, that you realize that if you do anything else, you will sense having a power over you. That's not him. What you want on you is that necessity Paul had that made him powerful and strong. He stepped out from the we and became the I, and you could do that too. So I pray, be content to pour out your rich life into the hungry, the weary. Do things that no one else will do. I love what, I think her name is Mary Lyon, and I believe she was a woman's, the woman's, 
uh, dean of a college, and I think it was back like in the 1700s, and she said this about missionary work, and we're all missionaries. She said, find out what it is that no one else is willing to do and do it and let necessity be laid upon you and let your glory be full and rich on that day you enter into heaven and you see Jesus face to face. God bless you.